Good evening. First of all, I would like to say salamat to Dr. Ted Achikoso for inviting me here to speak at your evening lecture series and for allowing me to see Manila and a part of the world that I have not yet seen. So I'm very excited to be here this evening. So thank you. And as Ted mentioned, I'm going to be talking a lot about aging and how we can influence the way we age. Because let's face it, we're all aging right now as you're eating and metabolizing the food that you're eating, you're aging. And we're all going to get old. So we need, to, we need to focus and think about how we can age better. And that's, that's an interest of mine. Um, and also how we can improve our aging brain so that our brains can function better when we're older. So this is a snapshot of your metabolism. It's really not complicated at all. Thousands of metabolic pathways are going on inside of each and every one of your organs. It's running everything from how your immune cells are able to fight off a virus or bacteria or kill a cancer cell, um, to how your heart is pumping blood throughout your body so that it can bring oxygen to your tissues. Whatever it is that's happening, it's your metabolism that's actually running you. It's allowing you to live. Well, all of those complicated metabolic pathways, 22% of them actually require a micronutrient as a cofactor. A cofactor means something is needed for the metabolic pathway to work properly. So if you can think about your metabolism as a piece of pie, then a big, big slice of it is actually needed. You need micronutrients to, to regulate that. And micronutrients are about 30 essential vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and fatty acids. We know that, um, at least in the United States, globally, probably as well, people are not getting enough of these micronutrients. So around 70% of the population in the United States is not getting enough vitamin D, around 60% is not getting enough vitamin E, magnesium, half the country is not getting enough of, calcium, vitamin K, it goes on and on. So uh, what are the consequences of not getting enough of these micronutrients? We don't see people walking around with rickets very often. Uh, we don't see people walking around with scurvy. I mean, their gums aren't falling out. So you think, well, what are the consequences of these micronutrient deficiencies? We don't see them. Um, RDAs have been set. RDAs are recommended daily allowances. They've been set to ensure that we don't get, you know, that we, we're basically getting enough of these micronutrients. Um, the RDAs are usually set around two standard deviations above what would cause a death in a mouse. So um, even if you're not getting enough of a certain vitamin and mineral, uh, you, st you still have a lot of room before you actually become you know, clinically sick. But there are a lot of subclinical effects. There are effects that are causing insidious types of damage. So back to our metabolism. There are metabolic pathways that are essential for survival right now that uh, require micronutrients to function. For example, if you, you're making energy in the form of ATP, well, that requires magnesium. And if you can't make energy, you simply can't live. So that's pretty much a short-term fu survival function. But there are also metabolic pathways that require micronutrients that are needed for long-term health. For example, repairing damage to your DNA. Well, you don't really have to repair damage to your DNA to live but you do need to repair it to avoid getting cancer five decades down the line. So what happens when you have two metabolic pathways that both require the same micronutrient, but you're not getting enough of that micronutrient? What happens to that micronutrient? Well, my mentor, Dr. Bruce Ames, proposed that the metabolic pathway that is essential for survival right now will get that micronutrient at the expense of long-term health pathways. So he calls this the uh, triage theory. And essentially what the, tr the triage theory uh, proposes is that during times of um, micronutrient deficiency or micronutrient inadequacies, there is a very strategic allocation of these micronutrients that are going to the pathways that are essential to keep you alive right now. 
and the pathways that are not essential for survival right now sort of get the short end of the stick. They're not going to get that micronutrient. And what happens is it leads to insidious types of damage that accumulate over time and can lead to diseases of aging, such as neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, for example. So let's talk about an example of the triage theory, vitamin K. Vitamin K uh, refers to a family of fat-soluble vitamins, uh, vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. We're going to talk just about vitamin K1. I'll circle back to vitamin K2 in a minute. But vitamin K1, also known as philoquinone, is uh, actually required for plants in order to do photosynthesis, which is how plants make energy. So dark green vegetables are a great source of vitamin K because you know, they need vitamin K to make energy. Well, about 65% of the United States population does not have adequate levels of vitamin K, which is around 90 to 120 micrograms a day, according, depending on whether or not you're male or female. So um, vitamin K actually has a lot of important functions inside the cell. One of those functions is it's required for the activation of proteins that are involved in blood clotting, so coagulation. And without vitamin K, those proteins cannot get activated and you won't be able to clot your blood, which could be pretty bad because you could internal bleeding and have a hemorrhage. So vitamin K is very, very important for this short-term survival function of you know, coagulation. Vitamin K goes to the liver where all these proteins involved in coagulation are and it activates them so that it can, that they can then um, proceed with their function in blood clotting. But there's another function of vitamin K and that function is involved in pulling calcium out of the blood vessels and arteries and bringing it to places where it should be, like the bones and muscle and other organs. Calcium is an important signaling molecule in many pathways. So these proteins that pull calcium out of the vascular system are also activated by vitamin K. But that's not really an essential function for short-term survival. I mean, you can have calcium build up in your blood vessels and arteries and be just fine for several decades. Um, but calcification of the blood vessels does lead to uh, cardiovascular diseases. In fact, calcification of the arteries is, in, is associated with a fourfold increased risk of cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis. It also increases vascular dementia because it's cutting off blood flow to the brain. And dietary calcium is very, very important. However, dietary calcium also very, very easily forms precipitates when it's in the, when contact with phosphorus in the blood vessels. And so if you're getting all this dietary calcium, but you're not allowing those proteins that are important for removing that calcium from the bloodstream and bringing it to your bones and bringing it to your muscle, then you can have a problem because you can have buildup of calcification of the arteries. We know from studies in humans that if you take a human and you cut vitamin K1 out of their diet, so you're making them deficient in vitamin K1, you don't take it all out, but you're, you're, you're really, really limiting the amount of vitamin K1 that they take in. We know that there's absolutely no change in blood coagulation. Your blood, blood clotting still occurs just fine. However, the proteins that are involved in uh, pulling calcium out of the arteries and blood vessels, they don't get activated which really suggests that there is a triage when a human is deficient in vitamin K1, that vitamin K1 is gonna go to that function that's important for survival right now, coagulation, blood clotting. And we, we do know that this is the case. There is a tissue specific um, allocation of vitamin K1. Vitamin K readily goes to the liver and the liver is where all these proteins that are involved in blood clotting are activated. Once enough vitamin K1 gets to the liver to activate all those proteins involved in blood clotting, then vitamin K stays around in the bloodstream, in the blood vessels, and activates proteins involved in removing calcium and bringing it to your bones. So you, it really requires that you get enough vitamin K1 to make sure it's, it's serving both functions for coagulation and for removing calcium from your blood vessels and blood ar in your arteries. We also know from looking at mouse studies there are about five different coagulation gene, genes involved in coagulation um, that are conserved. Mice have them, humans have them. 
Well, if you get rid of that gene, if you knock it out in a mouse, the mouse dies. It dies actually during embryonic development. It's embryonic lethal, meaning you simply cannot survive without these proteins that are involved in blood clotting, coagulation, which really does suggest that these vitamin K dependent proteins are essential for survival. There's about six other proteins that are also dependent on vitamin K, one for activation. But these, when you knock these proteins out of a mouse, when you genetically get rid of them, these mice don't die, but they end up having diseases of age. So for example, osteocalcin, which needs vitamin K to be activated, those animals, when they get knocked out, they have brittle bones, they have you know, very weak bones. Gas 6 or matrix glaw, matrix glaw, these, these animals have calcification of the, the arteries. Uh, TGFB1, these mice get cancer earlier. So these are all diseases of aging um, that, that show up if you knock out these genes or proteins that are important for, um, for removing calcium and bringing it to, to other parts of the body. So I really think that's nice evidence that there is a triage effect that occurs if you are deficient in a certain uh, vitamin, in this case, vitamin K1. Um, there is another fat-soluble vitamin K, which is vitamin K2. Um, vitamin K2 is, it does not go to the liver to activate blood clotting proteins. It actually stays around in the, in the bloodstream, the vascular system, where it, it activates those proteins involved in removing calcium from, from the, the vascular system. So it's kind of like a backup system. Um, you can convert vitamin K1 into vitamin K2 in your gut. Um, certain bacteria, micro, microbiome bacteria, are able to do that. However, antibiotics will wipe out about 75% of those uh, bacteria. So there are also food sources of it. The Japanese eat fermented soybeans. So vitamin K2 is made by bacteria, so fermented foods have it. Uh, natto is a very rich source of vitamin K2. Um, and organ meat is also a good source that we eat. We eat organ meat more than we eat natto in the United States. So, As another example, I want to talk about magnesium. Magnesium is a cofactor for over 300 different biological processes inside of your cell. 300 different biological processes. Half of the United States is not getting enough magnesium. So magnesium is at the center of a chlorophyll molecule. Chlorophyll is what get plants their green color. So again, green, dark green leafy vegetables are a great source of magnesium, just like they're a great source of vitamin K1. The RDA for magnesium is around 350 milligrams to 400 milligrams, depending on if you're male or female. Well, as I mentioned, there's 300 different processes that require magnesium. One of those processes is really important. It's called energy. You need magnesium to make ATP and to use ATP. Magnesium has to be bound to an ATP molecule in order for your body to be able to use it. So you can imagine, if you're deficient in magnesium, whatever magnesium you do have, that's going to get it. Because if you don't have that, you, you can't survive. You, you, you simply can't live without being able to make ATP. But that's not the only process that requires magnesium. There's 300 different processes. Well, one of those processes is also involved in repairing damage to DNA. So right now, we're all damaging our DNA because as a byproduct of metabolism, we're making damaging reactive oxygen species. Our immune system is being activated at a low level. And these immune, system, our immune cells make byproducts that also damage our DNA. So DNA damage um, can be repaired. And it can be repaired by DNA repair enzymes. And if that happens, then you're going to have a very happy cell because it's not going to be damaged. However, if your DNA repair pathways are not working properly, the DNA damage will not be prepared. And this can lead to mutations that could potentially lead to an unhealthy cell and those unhealthy cells can replicate and eventually form cancer. So DNA repair enzymes actually require magnesium as a cofactor. They need magnesium to be able to repair damage to DNA. There's been studies that have shown, for example, for people that are in, have the highest quartile of red blood cell magnesium, they have a 50% lower 
cancer-related mortality compared to people in the lowest quartile of magnesium. So that's pretty significant. Also, as Dr. Ted mentioned, there has been a study um, that was recently published showing that people, uh, for every 100 milligrams of magnesium uh, decrease in magnesium intake, there was a 24% increase in pancreatic cancer. So magnesium is very important for repairing damage that happens to your DNA, it's happening to all of us, it's just a matter of how much of that damage we can repair. And again, it's an insidious type of, you can't wake, wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and go, I've got DNA damage. No, you can't see DNA damage, but it's happening. So it's the kind of damage that's gonna show up in your fifth, sixth, seventh decade of life by the time it's too late. So it's important to be able to give your, your, your metabolism the right micronutrients that it needs to, to run optimally. But there are many, many people that are not getting their green leafy vegetables. They're eating a diet that is very caloric dense and, and high in lots of calories, but very low in micronutrients. So processed foods, fast foods, you know, these are refined carbohydrates, refined sugars, they're eating lots of these packaged foods, and they're not getting their greens. And the, and the greens are a delivery system for all these very important micronutrients. So this obesogenic diet, this diet that's high in refined food, refined packaged foods, but low in micronutrients, um, it leads to obesity, for one. And we know that obesity actually itself accelerates the aging process on a cellular level. I think most people know obesity is associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. It's associated with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. But it's also associated with a much higher cancer incidence. In fact, several different types of cancer, uh, obesity increases the risk two times as much. Uh, it's also associated with an increased risk for neurodegenerative diseases. Obesity takes seven years off lifespan, and an extreme obesity can take 14 years off of your lifespan. I mean, that's a long time, 14 years. I have been very interested in looking at DNA damage as a biomarker of aging. So uh, as we age, we accumulate more DNA damage. I mentioned it because we're all doing, I mean, every time you eat food, you metabolize the food and byproducts of that metabolism are damaging your DNA. It's just a matter of how much you can repair that damage and how much damage you're actually getting. It's a balancing act. Um, but we can actually measure this in people by using a proxy. It's called phosphorylated histone 2AX or gamma H2AX. So what happens is immediately after you have damage to your DNA, particularly two strand breaks, so a double-stranded break in your DNA, this, this protein gets phosphorylated and it serves as a marker, a molecular marker, and it amplifies immediately after damage happens because it's signaling to the cell, hey, come on, bring some DNA repair enzymes here, repair this damage. Well, we can use this marker as a proxy for DNA damage. And so for the past three years, I've been measuring this marker in people, uh, people that are young, people that are old, people that are lean, people that are obese, um, as a proxy for looking at uh, health. So the more DNA damage you have, the less healthy you are. DNA, DNA damage accumulates in stem cells and it's associated with aging of your stem cells. So your stem cells start to age quicker, they die, causes them to die quicker um, when you deplete your stem cell populations and it's hard to replenish uh, your cellular populations in a certain organ. And also it's associated with cancer, as I mentioned. So what I found, um, I've been doing some preliminary work over the past couple of years, is that if you look at lean people that have a, a body mass index, which is not a great marker for, for obesity, but it'll do, um, if they have a BMI of less than 25, and you compare their DNA damage to people that have a BMI of greater than 28, it's almost twice as much DNA damage. These are the same age people same age, so they should not have, I mean, this looks like an old person. Usually you see, you see this much of a difference when you're looking at like a 30 year difference in age. So you're talking about accelerating the aging process on a cellular level, and this is not something that people can see, but it's happening. 
And what it's going to do is it's going to increase their risk of cancer. It's going to increase their risk of cellular aging, of getting neurodegenerative diseases. But there is a simple solution. Eat your greens. The greens have all the things you need. They have the magnesium. They have vitamin K1. They have calcium. You know, there's lots of types of fiber in there, vitamin C, folate. There's so many different important micronutrients. And I think that um, a good way to do it is I like to make a smoothie, but you can also eat your salads. Try to get your greens with every meal. It's, it's important to get these micronutrients. They're running your metabolism. So I like to make a smoothie once a day. It uh, has kale leaves, rainbow chard, some spinach, tomato, avocado, apple, some frozen blueberries, and uh, it's pretty good. Okay, so I'm going to shift topic just a little bit and talk about some of my other research involving vitamin D. About 70% of the U.S. population does not have adequate levels of vitamin D. And I was told that about half of the Philippines also don't have enough, they don't have adequate levels of vitamin D, which at first surprised me because, you know, you so, get so much sun here. But then as I came here um, yesterday, I, I looked around, and I noticed that everyone is walking around with an umbrella. So they're actually not getting the sun, they're blocking themselves from the sun. Um, so that, uh, that, now I understand why possibly the, half the Philippines also is not getting enough vitamin D. Well, the sun is the primary source of vitamin D, so anything that blocks out UVB radiation, like sunscreen, um, dark pigment like melanin, which protects you from the burning rays of the sun, also can filter out UVB, which you need to make vitamin D. Age, so a 70-year-old makes four times less vitamin D in their skin from the sun than their former 20-year-old self. And also latitude, so where you live, but here in the Philippines it's not much of an issue, but in many parts of the world, but they can't, people can't even make vitamin D from the sun five to six months out of the year. Uh, body fat also regulates the bioavailability of vitamin D. So vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and it's stored in fat. But the more fat you have, the less it can be released in the bloodstream to be activated into a hormone, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But why should we care about vitamin D? Well, vitamin D actually regulates the aging process. So these mice right here are the same age. The mouse here on the left has had genetically knocked out its vitamin D receptor. So it, it cannot respond to vitamin D at all. So it's essentially like vitamin D deficient. But these are the same mice four months later. Look, look at that mouse. I mean, it is rapidly aging. It's lost all its hair. Its skin looks awful. Its organs are aging. And um, it's, the same, it's the same age as that mouse there on the right, which is about... I guess they're about eight and a half months old there. Okay, so how do you know if you are getting enough vitamin D? Blood levels of vitamin D, according to the Endocrine Society, what's considered deficient is blood levels less than 20 nanograms per milliliter. What's considered inadequate is less than 30, between 20 and 30 milligrams per liter, and adequate is between 30 and 60 nanograms per milliliter. Why do I say 30 and 60? Well, there's been about 33 meta-analyses studies dating back from 1966 all the way to 2013 that have looked at all-cause mortality, so people dying of cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, respiratory disease, all non-accidental deaths. And people that had blood levels of vitamin D actually between 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter had the lowest all-cause mortality. So they were less likely to die of all these diseases. And in fact, there was, there's also been some other studies that have looked at people that have genetically low levels of vitamin D because of a certain gene polymorphism in, in a gene that makes them not make enough vitamin D as well. And they also have a much higher all-cause mortality. So as I mentioned, UVB radiation is the primary source of vitamin D. You actually convert something in your skin called 7-dehydrocholesterol into vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 then gets released into the bloodstream, it goes to the liver, and the liver it gets converted into 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And that's what we measure as a marker for vitamin D levels. But that's not actually the active vitamin D. So 25-hydroxy vitamin D then goes to the kidneys, and in the kidneys it gets activated into a steroid hormone. So vitamin D is actually a hormone. And this hormone is regulating about 5% of the human genome. 
So that's a lot of genes here that vitamin D is controlling. It is controlling 5% of the physiological processes going on inside of each and every one of your organs, including the brain. So it all, it, the, the way it's controlling these physiological processes is vitamin D binds to the vitamin D receptor. And once it binds to that receptor, vitamin D receptors partners up with its friend here, the retinoid receptor, and these guys go right into the nucleus of your cell, into your DNA, and they recognize this little telltale sequence called a vitamin D response element. And this little telltale sequence is it's six nucleotides separated by a three nucleotide spacer. And the nucleotide sequence itself can tell this complex to either turn genes on and say, do your, do your function, get active, or it can say, turn genes off. And that sequence itself, just the way, the sequence that, that occurs in a gene can actually tell this complex, this vitamin D receptor complex, whether or not it wants to activate a gene or whether or not it wants to deactivate a gene. One of those genes that vitamin D regulates is the gene called tryptophan hydroxylase. Tryptophan hydroxylase is important because it converts the essential amino acid tryptophan into serotonin. And what my research identified is uh, actually vitamin D is regulating. Humans have two forms, we have two separate tryptophan hydroxylase enzymes. We have one in the brain and we have one in the gut and also in, in our immune cells. And what I found is that, is that um, the sequence itself, the sequence itself in this gene one sequence was actually associated with activation, and one sequence was associated with deactivation. So vitamin D is actually regulating these two genes that are important to make serotonin. It's regulating them in opposite directions. So it's turning one on and it's turning the other off. So the one gene is in the gut. So we have a tryptophan hydroxylase in our gut. And actually around 90% of the serotonin that we make in our body happens in our gut. So most of the serotonin in our body is actually made in the gut. The serotonin made in the gut does not actually cross over the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. It can't, it can't get into the brain. A tryptophan can get into the brain and be converted into serotonin, but that's, um, that's done by the other enzyme. So in the gut, tryptophan hydroxylase 1 converts tryptophan into serotonin. And this is important because your platelets, your platelets can't make serotonin, but they need it because serotonin is what causes your platelets to coagulate when you have an injury, it causes your platelets to, to clot together. So the serotonin made in your gut has a very important function, and that function is to give it to your platelets so that they can clot when you have an injury. However, too much serotonin in the gut also causes inflammation because it activates T cells. So if you have too much serotonin in the gut, it can also cause GI inflammation, gut distress, and this has been shown in several different studies. Well, I found that vitamin D has uh, this gene has a, sequ a vitamin D sequence that vitamin D recognizes that turns it down, turns it off, so it's not as active. There's another gene, tryptophan hydroxylase gene, in the brain, and this gene is responsible for converting serotonin in your brain, which is what most of you are probably familiar with. Serotonin in your brain is important for mood, it's important for a lot of functions we'll talk about in a minute. But what I found is that vitamin D actually turns on this gene and makes it active so that it converts tryptophan into serotonin. So I started to put these pieces together. Uh, it had been known that vitamin D deficiency was associated to autism. It also had been known that serotonin deficiency was linked to autism, but no one had sort of put these two together. So I started to, to realize that once I found vitamin D was regulating serotonin, that this may explain some of the characteristics, uh, characteristics associated with autism. For example, it can explain the low associations of vitamin D. Um, it can explain how autistics have low serotonin in the brain, but they have high serotonin levels in the gut. It can also explain the high male prevalence of autism. So males are about five times more likely to get autis autism uh, than females. And also it can explain the 
presence of autoimmune antibodies in mother, uh, mothers of autistics' um, blood. So as vitamin D levels have been de decreasing um, over the past few decades, autism levels have been increasing. In fact, there's been about a 600% increase in autism since the 1970s. And uh, genetics only accounts for a small percentage. In fact, over 70% of all autistic cases cannot be linked to a genetic cause. Now, autism, increased autism awareness obviously plays an important role for, our, for our increased diagnosis of autism. But there has to be some other underlying mechanism. So as vitamin D deficiency has gone, as vitamin D sufficiency has gone down, autism incidence has actually increased. As I mentioned, vitamin D regulates the gene that makes serotonin in the brain from tryptophan. So you guys probably are familiar with serotonin and how serotonin is important for mood, but also serotonin plays a very, very important role during early brain development. It's actually called a brain morphogen because during early fetal brain development, serotonin shapes the structure and the wiring of the developing brain. Serotonin tells the neurons where to go and what types of neurons to become. And in fact, in mice, when you get rid of the ability to make serotonin in the developing brain, it causes abnormal wiring and structure of the brain and it leads to abnormal behaviors, which are considered autistic-like behaviors in, in animals. So serotonin plays a very important role in in brain development. So this is where I published a paper on how vitamin D hormone regulates the production of serotonin and how this may relate to autism. Because this gene is important to make serotonin, uh, and there was another paper that was published shortly after that that validated my, my paper and did show biochemically vitamin D does actually increase tryptophan hydroxylase 2 in neurons, and so it is regulating the production of serotonin. So how does this relate to the male prevalence? Well, as I mentioned, males are five times more likely to get autism. Well, estrogen actually activates the same gene, tryptophan hydroxylase 2, in the brain that vitamin D does. Uh, actually, it can increase it by like almost tenfold, which is quite a bit. So how does this relate to autism? Well, you know, sex hormones aren't made, you don't make sex hormones during, during fetal development, but it has been shown for example, like the amniotic fluid of a, female, of, a feti uh, of a female fetus has higher levels of estrogen than of a male fetus. And then immediately after birth, so neonates, um, females have much higher levels of estrogen in the, in the frontal cortex. So it's possible if you have a mother that was deficient in vitamin D, um, if it was a female fetus, maybe it was protected from that vitamin D deficiency because estrogen was able to sort of rescue that phenotype by activating the same gene that vitamin D activates. I also think it explains how the, the autoimmune related, um, how autoimmunity is related to autism. So we know that low maternal vitamin D levels, so we know that mothers of autistic children have these autoantibodies in their blood that are against fetal brain proteins. In fact, they're three times more likely to have these antibodies in their blood that are against fetal brain proteins. What is that doing there? You're not supposed to have antibodies in your bloodstream against brain proteins. Um, and there's a group at UC Davis that showed if you take monkeys and you cause them to have an autoimmune response, those, those pregnant monkeys will make will have a strong autoimmune response and the antibodies will cross into the fetal brain and it'll cause abnormal brain development. So how does this relate to vitamin D? Well, I mentioned there's two different genes involved in making serotonin. One gene, the tryptophan hydroxylase 1, is the one that vitamin D actually turns off. It turns it down. Well, tryptophan can be converted into serotonin and this, happen this can happen in your gut and also in your placenta. The placenta tissue also has this enzyme. So if you're, making this, if you're converting all the tryptophan into serotonin, it's not able to go into this other pathway, which also can convert tryptophan into something called kynurenine, which is very important to make a certain type of immune cell called T-regulatory cells. T-regulatory cells are very important for preventing an autoimmune response. 
Um, in fact, in mice, if you get rid of the ability to make kynurinine, the fem pregnant mice have such a strong autoimmune response that the fetus is aborted. So it's just, it's too strong. So it's been shown that this is very, very important for preventing autoimmunity, specifically during pregnancy. So what we think happens is that under conditions of low vitamin D, the tryptophan is being sucked into this pathway to make serotonin in the placenta. Uh, and the reason for that is because tryptophan binds much more tightly to tryptophan hydroxylase than it does to the other enzyme, IDO. So it's kind of acting as a sink for the tryptophan. It's, it's sinking up all the, the tryptophan to be converted into serotonin and not leaving enough tryptophan to be converted into kynurinine and therefore T regulatory cells go down when you don't have enough T regulatory cells um, during, during embryonic development, which by the way is a foreign, you have a foreign thing in your body. So the mother's immune system is going, whoa, what's this? What's this, you know, what's this here? And it starts to mount an immune response. We think that it's possible that the immune response could then affect the, the fetal brain development and lead to abnormal fetal brain development. So I think this has a, a big take home for prevention of, of autism specifically, that is have a maternal, a woman who is going to conceive or a woman who is pregnant, get her vitamin D levels measured make sure she has adequate levels of vitamin D and supplement accordingly. We know that around 1,000 IUs can raise blood serum levels of vitamin D by about five nanograms per milliliter. So if you have a person that has, a mother that has levels of 20 nanograms per mil, if you wanna bring her up to 30, she's actually gonna need around 4,000 IUs a day. So I think that's a pretty um, easy take home. Vitamin D supplements are cheap. They're almost a penny a pill. So there's really you know, no, no reason why people should be deficient in, in vitamin D. Um, that's, my, that's my two cents. But if we're gonna talk about serotonin, there's another micronutrient we need to consider, and that is the marine omega-3 fatty acids, eicosapentaenoic acid and docosahexaenoic acid, so EPA and DHA. Leading up to my second publication, I began to ask myself, why do the marine omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D seem to kind of help treat, help prevent the same constellation of symptoms? How does that happen? Now, I believe this is all happening through the serotonin pathway. So as I mentioned, vitamin D is regulating the gene that converts tryptophan into serotonin. Um, and Serotonin, in addition to being a brain morphogen during early brain development, it also regulates many, many different behaviors. It regulates social behavior, it regulates impulse control, it regulates decision-making, aggression, it regulates so many different behaviors. And we know this because many different experiments have been done in normal humans. You can actually take a person and give them a shake, like a big drink of branched chain amino acids like leucine and isoleucine. Branched chain amino acids compete with tryptophan for transport into the brain and they win. So if, you, if you're eating a bunch of leucine and isoleucine, then you're com out competing your tryptophan to be transported into the brain. And what ends up happening is about six hours later, 90% of your brain serotonin levels drop. So you're, you're working on around 10% of your brain serotonin levels. And what's been shown is that normal people, when they're depleted of their brain serotonin levels, they become very impulsive. Their long-term planning shuts down. Uh, they get aggressive, irritable, moody. Uh, they, have problem, they have trouble recognizing facial expressions, so empathy uh, is, is also affected. And sensory gating. So sensory gating is the ability there's lots of things going on in this room right now, and I'm still focusing on my talk, but that's because my sensory gating is working. I'm able to filter out extraneous sensory stimuli that's happening, all, our brains are doing this all the time. Well, serotonin's important for that process, and when you don't have serotonin, you can't do that properly, and so you end up having sort of like a sensory overload where you, just, every, you can't focus, everything's coming in at once, and you get this sensory overload. So serotonin's playing a very, very important role in a lot of different brain functions and a lot of different w behavioral functions. So um, where does the omega-3 come in? So I mentioned the vitamin D, again, regulates the synthesis, the production of 
serotonin from tryptophan. So now we're in the brain here. Um, tryptophan goes, gets into the brain. It's being, it's being made into serotonin. Well, well, serotonin then has to be released from a presynaptic neuron into the synapse. And once it's released into the synapse, then it binds to a serotonin receptor on the postsynaptic synapse. Um, and then, that it, it, then serotonin you know, does its function. So it has to bind to that receptor in order to have, exert its effects. It's able to, uh, so it's able to regulate all those processes I just talked about. Well, it turns out that inflammation, inflammatory molecules, which can be generated in the gut by your immune system, they can cross over the blood-brain barrier and stop serotonin from being released, and this has been shown. So the E2 series prostaglandins, for example, they, can, they cross over the blood-brain barrier, and they actually inhibit serotonin from being released from the presynaptic neuron. Well, EPA, one of the marine omega-3 fatty acids, actually inhibits the production of these E2 series prostaglandins, and it allows more serotonin to be released. The other marine omega-3 fatty acid, DHA, is very important because it's it makes up your cell membrane, um, and it's, that's very important because for neurons, all your receptors are on the cell membrane, and so you want the structure of that receptor to be functional. You want it to be correct. Well, when you get rid of DHA, the membrane becomes messed up. The fluidity of it's kind of altered, and what happens is the, the serotonin receptor can't bind to serotonin very well, and that's also been shown. So under conditions of, let's say, low vitamin D and you're not getting enough of your marine omega-3 fatty acids, you're having compound effects because you have now, first of all, you're not making enough serotonin, and serotonin's not being released from the presynaptic neuron because of the inflammation, and then whatever is released isn't, isn't, it can't find that receptor because the receptor structure is all messed up. So now you're having multiple problems with the serotonin pathway. And, and you can imagine in combination with gene polymorphisms, there are many different gene polymorphisms involved in the serotonin pathway. People, you know, people have uh, gene polymorphisms in this TPH2 gene, so they're already genetically predisposed to not making enough serotonin. In those cases, when you already have someone not making up enough serotonin, and then on top of that, they don't have enough, they're not getting enough vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids, I mean, it's like a nuclear bomb for you know, low serotonin. So again, um, where, what's the take home for this? And the take home is get your vitamin D and you can also take, eat your fish or take fish oil. Both of those things are, are you know, easy take homes. Um, and there's, there's really widespread effects. There's been shown, there's been a lot of different widespread uh, vitamin D and omega-3 deficiencies throughout the United States. Um, and I'm not, sure, I'm not sure about the Philippines in terms of the omega-3. You guys might eat some more fish than we do, but people are not eating enough fish um, back in the United States. So I think that raising your vitamin D and your omega-3 fatty acid levels will be a positive thing for affecting your serotonin system and for the way your brain is functioning. And with that, I will say thank you, and uh, I'll take any questions.